As the age of heroes faded and monsters were cast from the world, Zeus brought the wisest of the titans, Prometheus and his brother Epithemius, a task. They were to create the animals and form man to populate the upcoming age. Epithemius, whose name means afterthought, was always quick to rush into things. His brother Prometheus, or forethought, preferred to consider them first. So when Zeus gave them his edict, Prometheus began to think, but Epithemius set right to work. He gave bears massive size and power. He gave ravens flight and snakes venom. He gave lions jaws that bite and claws that rend. He gave turtles shells to hide in and deer antlers to gouge. He was so enthusiastic in his giving of gifts that when it came time to fashion man, he was all out. There was nothing left to give them, and yet man was supposed to be the greatest of them all. So, panicked, he ran to his brother and asked for help. Prometheus considered, and then, with all the skill and wisdom endowed to him, he bent to the task of crafting man. He began to sculpt them out of clay, and as he worked, it soon became clear what gift he chose to give them. Alone among all the animals, he would make them walk upright like the gods. When he was done sculpting them, he bent down and breathed into them life. With this breath, he instilled his second gift, reason, and the ability to think much as he did. And finally, he would give them one last gift, better protection than any hide or claw. He flew up to the house of the sun and stole for mankind fire. Fire from which all art springs. Fire which makes further creation possible. But it was not this great transgression alone for which he would be condemned. For there was a second act of defiance which he performed in the service of fledgling man. As mankind set about in their new and plentiful world, it became clear that they should give thanks and sacrifice to the gods. Or at least, it became clear that the gods expected it. So Prometheus helped them prepare a great ox as a sacrifice to Zeus. But when the animal was carved up, he had them wrap the best parts in the hide and cover that hide with its disgusting entrails. And then he had them take the bones and cover them in shining, glistening fat. He then offered Zeus to pick one of the piles for his offering. Zeus chose the shimmering, glistening mound. When he went through it, though, he was outraged to find it was all bones. But the decision had been made, and this is why Greeks only burnt the bones and the fat of animals when making sacrifices, and kept the rest for themselves to feast on. Still, Zeus did not yet bind Prometheus to the great rock. First, he would avenge himself on mankind. Because, you see, Mankind was still just that, mankind, and not yet humankind because there were no women. So Zeus gathered the gods and had each of them craft some aspect of a new being that he would send to live with mankind. And each of them labored, each adding their own gifts, until they brought to life a being named Pandora, which means the gift for all. She was the first woman and was wondrous for all to behold. But Zeus was cunning and kind of a jerk. And for each gift the gods had imbued her with, he also found a sorrow and put it in a box. He then gave her the box, telling her never to open it, and sent her along to Epithemius' home, knowing he couldn't resist such a refined being. Now Prometheus had told Epithemius never to accept gifts from Zeus, as they were almost certainly tricks. But as always, Epithemius did not think before he acted, and upon seeing such beauty and such grace, invited Pandora to stay with him. She showed him the box that Zeus had given her, and they put it aside, and for some time they didn't open it. But eventually, Zeus's box was too much of a temptation for Pandora who the gods had endowed with a natural curiosity. So she took out the box, just to take a quick peek. When she lifted the lid, all manner of horrors flew out. Rage, jealousy, spite, greed, sloth, 
covetness, and probably people who check their phones in movie theaters. And so she slammed the lid back down, but it was too late. Only one ponderous thing still remained in the bottom, hope, which can be seen as the greatest good, the thing that makes all other ills endurable, or it can be seen as the final, most potent mischief of them all as it is what makes mankind continue to endure all the other sufferings. Either way, the torrent of wretchedness which plagues humanity to this day flowed from the family of Prometheus, the being who loved them most. And thus the first part of Zeus's revenge was complete, but Prometheus himself was also made to suffer. And so Zeus called two of his servants, Force and Violence, to seize Prometheus, and with chains of adamantine bind him to the top of a mountain in the Caucasus. But it was not for his benevolence towards man alone that Zeus had him thus bound. Oh no. Zeus also had another motive, for it was prophesied that like his father before him and his father before that, Zeus would be undone by his own son. The problem was, Zeus was not exactly what you'd call a mm, monogamous god. So there was only one being who had the wisdom and the forethought to divine who the mother might be of the son that would overthrow him. And that was Prometheus. So Zeus sent a messenger, Hermes, to Prometheus high up on the rock to ask him his secret. But knowing that if he told it, the gods would rule over humanity forever, and the human race would never get their turn as lords, he said to Hermes, Go and persuade the sea waves not to break. You will persuade me no more easily. Hermes then warned him that yet a greater torture awaited him if he did not relent. But in knowing his torment was unjust, Prometheus found strength. His body was chained, but without his complicity, his spirit could never be. So he held to his conviction that helping the mortal race was right and that brutality and power and the might of tyranny would never rule him. Though he was damned, his soul was his own, and so when Hermes threatened to set upon him a starving eagle that would every day rip through his flesh and feast upon the sweet black blood of his liver if he did not tell the secret, Prometheus said, There is no force that can compel my speech. So let Zeus hurl his blazing bolts, and with the white wings of snow, and with thunder, and with earthquakes, confound the reeling world. None of this will bend my will. Hermes, confounded, set the eagle upon Prometheus and left in frustration. And then, each day, for all time, the eagle would tear his skin to rags and peck out his liver. And each night, the liver would regrow, and the flesh would knit itself back together so the process could begin again. There are many stories, though, that tell us that Prometheus eventually became free. Here the tales get muddled, and the chronology becomes strange. But some say Hercules found him in his wanderings, slew the eagle, and with his Herculean strength rent apart the chains of adamant that no other being could undo. Other stories tell of a centaur named Chiron, who offered himself as a sacrifice in Prometheus's place, for it was said that only if an immortal were to die for him would he be able to be free. But whatever the story, they all agree on one thing. Prometheus was never vanquished. Though in chains and in torment, he remained unconquered, and tyranny was made to bend before he.